it's the four week guys that's out but i mean from my side there's no pressure i just feel that uh, um whatever suits all our fellows you know, people prefer to carry on like this i mean that's all right people should feel safe and uh, they should feel that uh, the institute is doing whatever is possible to maintain uh, you know all the health and safety procedures. the other question i had very quickly before we start with uh, uh, with subuji's uh, presentation uh, was uh, what about you know inviting you know there are a number of uh, speakers we would have liked to invite uh, under normal circumstances they would have come to shimla but do you think we should start a webinar series now uh, because many other organizations and it i myself have participated in given talks during this period so uh, do you think that apart from the fellow seminars it's possible to scale up a little bit and even if uh, you know we don't actually meet in the seminar room next time can we have a webinar and invite uh, an outside speaker this was my second question what what do what do you think about that some of you think about that? that's a good idea should do that i think that uh, we are going to go in for this in the long term and i think if you are going in for if you are going for it in the long term then i think we need to shift to the webinar mode as the rest of the world is doing well uh, you're absolutely right and this don't know what the future has in store uh covid 19 we don't even know about second wave infections and so forth so uh while we keep our fingers crossed and hope that our activities can if not return to normal at least we can have a few face to face events with social distancing because in other parts of the world they they have resumed certain activities as you know but uh you know parallelly i mean we are missing out on our academic life and feed because uh, a part of our uh, activities is not only to the uh, you know each other fellow uh, you know fellows who are resident but, uh, you know to invite other people that was what enriches us as an institute so i think to implement the latter we don't need make any fundamental changes in our meeting pattern we can uh, continue to meet on webex and still uh, you know maybe invite invite a speaker or so to join us so, uh, please think about this and uh, um you know either we start we start a webex seminar series uh, without meet in person in the seminar hall or we do both you know i think this is this is the method for us to think about and uh, if if you're all agreeable at least we can do you know trial webex in which we invite an outside speaker we can do that maybe next week or the week after you know adequate notice now so i think if all of you agree and if you join it it's also very important that If we invite a distinguished speaker, you know, come in, otherwise, uh, uh, and then participate as we normally do with questions and answers and so forth. Otherwise, I, mean, I think it'll it'll uh, not uh, you know not be very positive uh, for the speaker to join in and then have only two or three people. So th these are some of the thoughts I had. But let's have a trial maybe in the coming week or so, and. Uh, we can also uh, if people feel safe we can also uh, think about meeting uh, in the seminar hall with some social distancing i think it will also cheer us up to see each other I, that's what i feel personally rather than uh, you know be confined as you said uh, as professor raju was saying it's not lockdown but lock up so <laughs> so with that and with uh, with professor uh, ramaswamy's and and, uh, and and dr subhu's uh, permission i will just say a few words and then hand it over to professor vijay ramaswamy so uh, you know the is bharatiyas nandanar charitra 
Kirtani. Kirtani, uh, I think, if I've got the Tamil uh, pronunciation right. What is fascinating, of course, uh, about mm. this uh, topic is that it deals with at least uh, three, if not four, periods of history. First of all, uh, the mythical period in which Nandana actually lived, uh, you know, uh, or was supposed to have lived. Nandanar, of course, is a great saint who, who comes from a, what today we may call the scheduled caste uh, community. And his, his story is celebrated in the Periya Puran. Now, that's a wonderful uh, book. It's, it's a very, very powerful and, uh, uh, you know, I think Subhuji has called it a hagiography. But uh, Tamil speakers uh, consider it a, a kind of, uh, uh, what should I say, a, a kind of devotional text. Canon. Uh, Canon. Which, uh, which is exactly, which is, you know, which tells the stories of the, of the great uh, Nyanmar's, uh, you know, of Tamil country. And uh, I don't think any part of Tamil Nadu is not, is uninfluenced by the stories of these saints, you know, uh, uh, you know, whether it's Manika Vachagar, or uh, Tirugayan Sambandar, uh, you know, or uh, uh, you know the, the the great saint who, who took who plucked out his arm after him, uh, you know, to the Lord, uh, and so forth. Now, and you know, in in more recent times, we 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 know about this text also because of Ramana Maharishi, because when he was a young boy, he was only when he left home, he had he was so influenced by the Periya Puran that when he stood in the Minakshi uh, temple in Madurai, uh, where you have the images of these saints. You know, his, his eyes were filled with tears and he was, he was praying for the kind of devotion that these saints had. And after that, before you knew it, he was gone, he had left home, and uh, etc. There's a, there's a great story about, uh, about that whole event and his... his uh, you might call it near death, or you can call it an actual death experience, you know, which completely transformed it. So anyhow, there's the mythical period when Nyanmar, when the when the great Nyanmar uh, Nandanar actually lived or was supposed to have lived. Then you have the Periyapura, that's the second period. Then the third period, which is where we come into the picture, is uh, is actually the late 19th century, I think 1860s, if I'm not mistaken, from what I remember in Subhuji's, yeah. uh, exactly. Yeah. And this is the time of Gopal Krishna Bharatiyar. Now, for me, it's a, it's a very well, uh, you know, I think uh, elaborated text that he, he has sent to us. And we heard him, uh, you know, a long time back when, when we met him uh, during the uh, fellowship interviews. Because the, the, the paradoxes of a sort, uh, that uh, that Gopal Krishna Bharatiyar was himself a Brahmin. He was a Smartha Brahmin uh, who followed, it would seem, the rituals of his community. And yet he takes a position in favor of this Dalit saint. And and the composition is like an opera, uh, operatic co composition. It can be sung, if I'm not mistaken. Sure. Uh, now, so uh, the, my, my, my point is, so, so it combines, you might say, devotion, uh, social reform and a certain kind of politics. So for me, that that period in 1860s is really fascinating because that's the time of the uh, you know great social reform uh, reforms in Hinduism all over India. You know, you have a figure like Dayanand Saraswati. You have a figure like Ramakrishna Paramhamsa around the same time, and many of these figures, as we know it. Uh, belonged actually to the uh, upper castes of the Brahmins and so forth, who then uh, fought or who took a position which was, uh, you know, in favor of the uh, of of the, those deprived. And it's I think that it's a wonderful metaphor of that unmoving Nandi, you know, who who blocks the saint's vision uh, of uh, darshan of 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 the deity. Uh, and I think if I remember right from my reading of Periyapuran long back. And I, I believe the Nandi was made to move by Lord Shiva. I, I, please correct me if it's true. Yeah. And we have yeah. a similar story in Maharashtra. We have a similar story, I think, of Chokha Mela, where he's also standing outside the temple. 
and uh, his vision is blocked and the lord turns if i'm not mistaken there's something like that now udupi udupi kanakadasa okay. udupi kanakadasa but i think in the maharashtrian saints also there is a similar story i'm trying to remember it i, I may be wrong but here's my point my point is that uh, the the uh, subuji's narrative on its own stands quite strong quite firm very combined social reform uh, you know the politics of caste and and, uh, and devotion uh, you know, very effectively but my only question is this this is where this is what i want to raise and then stop we must also look at it from the retrospective perspective you know which is the fourth period of of history uh, we, when we historicize this text the fourth or maybe the fifth the fourth period is the period of the uh, of the self respect movement in tamil nadu of the dravidian movement led by periyar in which the shoe as it were is on the other foot and the brahmin instead of being the oppressor becomes actually a victim after that and a large number of brahmins are driven out of tamil nadu now does that uh, does that historical uh, fact and the knowledge of it inflect our understanding you know when we contextualize and historicize uh, uh, gopala krishna bharatiyar's uh, intervention that is my question and the fifth period would be a present period where a lot of water has you know flown down the kaveri so to speak where, where we have we have gone into a period which is post uh, the uh, post the dravidianism of periyar 2 and uh, there's something else going on so my my only question is that we please the 1860s or that period as the as subuh seems to have or do we have the hindsight beyond the, that when we when we approach this day i'm done thank you so much and uh, and i i request uh, Vijaya ji, who is herself a great expert in Tamil, Sanskrit, and of course history, uh, who has been twice fellow of IIAS, to take over. And, and thank you, Subhaji, for giving us this chance thank to you. engage with this very, very interesting and rich text. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Vijaya. Um, can you uh, see me? No. You let it turn on your camera. Yes. Hmm. Vijay, um, camera. Ah, uh, yeah, we can see you. You can see me, right? Yeah. Um. Okay, I'm delighted to be here and to be able to chair this session today for two reasons. First, as uh, Professor Parajpe pointed out, our tra academic trajectory has been somewhat similar. we both began as economic historians i still remember your landmark work on the kaveri basin and from economic history you moved to looking at the people the the social life involved in agriculture and so it takes you on to agricultural labor and in fact connects immediately with nandana and the third trajectory um Uh, the third moment has been towards bhakti towards devotion and for me this has been very crucial because i never saw devotion as something that is complacent as something that is um, you know socialized but as something that is uh, that uh, epitomizes dissent so for me devotion and dissent have always gone together so to that extent absolutely yeah <laughs> so uh, all my work as you know 70% of what i have published is on this aspect so i'm delighted to be here for that reason as well and um, i'm delighted because i'm able to connect with all of you i think i'm missing the institute terribly i'm just dying to get back i keep pestering ravindra as to what he can do for me i'm <laughs> desperate to get back yeah so this is uh, this is something that's i hope soon maybe another couple of weeks i'll be back there You know, I just I feel so stifled in Delhi. Delhi is terrible. Yes. Delhi is sure. Delhi is sure hell. Right. <laughs> anyway, right. Having right. Said right. That, yeah. <laughs> having said that, um, I think I'll move on to talk about to introduce Subhu. Um, he had, he was an exceptional student at the CHS. Of course, very much younger, but um, as I said, he did his work on the Kaveri Basin, and then. 
instead of continuing as all of us did and following the same academic group, he moved out and chose to work in Ekalavya. And which has done, an, a, I mean, tremendous work in the field of education, especially rural education and in the Hindi medium. They have brought progressive ideas to those uh, to the children studying in the countryside and that uh, textbooks are very, very highly rated. He went on to become the director of Ekalavya and retired. But um, his academic pursuits have always continued. And as uh, he told him, he moved from economic history to social history. And now his present work on Gopal Krishna Bharati comes as a very pleasant surprise to me because I'm glad that he is making these linkages, which to me were always very crucial. Uh, so over to Subhu. And um, once you through me briefly, I must tell you, apologize if sometimes the questions are getting mixed up because the first time we are trying this this sharing uh web sharing is something that i never seen i hope it works so over to subhu thank you vijaya and uh, let me begin with a little thank you to everyone to all of you to be here and uh, particularly i'm thankful to the institute for uh, having me here as a fellow to work on some issues which have been very deeply personal to me. You know, I don't know whether I'm not from the academic field formally. And uh, these were questions with which I grew up as a person in a family, South Indian family, uh, which was quite steeped in music, in uh, the folklore, in the religious lore. Periya Puranam, as uh, Makranji said. And these were the questions, and of course, the problem of caste and untouchability, which troubled us no end. But these are really personal questions. And uh, I'm very thankful that I am allowed to the luxury of pursuing these questions here. And secondly, I would like to thank Vijaya for accepting to be the chairperson here, uh, mainly because of two reasons. One, when I began my academic foray 40 years ago, Vijaya was there to lead me into the ABCs of Tamil history. And when I'm returning back to it after 35 years break, she's again that helping, helping me with the same project. Uh, it's really nice to be with her and work with her. Okay, let me begin with uh, what I am planning to do today. Uh, uh, I hope I can keep the time and I will shift to the screen for a PowerPoint presentation. Hope that works. I'll share my screen. Can you all see the screen, please? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I begin with this. Uh, I'm going to work on Gopal Krishna Bharatiya's Nandana Charitra Kirtanai. Uh, I think Makranji mentioned this. Uh, it's one of very popular songs of Gopal Krishna Bharatiya. Uh, sung by almost every major Carnatic musician, which begins like this, the way Vali Marai Tirukkude, Malai Pole, Uru Maadu Padu Tirukkude. There's a huge bull lying on the way and it's uh, stopping my vision. This is a composition from Gopal Krishna Bharatiya. Uh, Nandanar, a Dalit Bhakta, is standing in front of a temple hoping to get a glimpse of the sanctum. That is because he cannot enter the temple. But his view is blocked by a massive Nandi and he pours out his anguish in the form of a song. This is the temple and you can see that if Nandanar were to stand, he couldn't even be standing uh, just where the motorcycles are. He'll be standing right at the edge of the road because that is the distance he has to keep to the temple. And these two are uh, statues put up outside this temple, right at the end of the street that you see. Uh, these statues have been put up by his uh, followers today. 
So even today he doesn't have an entry into the temple. But <laughs> on hearing the song, the Lord ordered the Nandi to shift. So you can see that the Nandi here has uh, shifted. Can you see the Nandi here? Or is it blocked by Vijaya? Can you all see the Nandi? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So it's a huge Nandi, you can see that, and that opens the vision of the inner sanctum. Now, to me, this is very important because the three factors which combine uh, the combination of devotion, social protest, and aesthetics, you know, whether in the form of a song or uh, in the form of poetry or art, this combination has a capability to bring about change. And not just change in the world around us, but it changes the three components themselves. So this is the central theme that I want to explore. But as you can see, the Nandi did not like it a bit, this being asked to shift around. So this transformation is not such an easy thing. That there is a deep tension between transformation and the conservative dimension. And this tension has to be understood and explored. You can, if you go to this temple, Tirupungur, you can see the Nandi shifted sideways. But people there will tell you, look at the Nandi carefully. The Nandi is not happy. It's clenched his teeth and it, the sinews are all strained. So this strain is very palpable once you go there. So, okay, uh, briefly about Nandana Charitra Kirtana, and then I'll kind of return to this theme. Uh, it's an operatic composition, as uh, Makaranji pointed out. Uh, it's uh, not just meant, not just something to be sung, but it has a variety of genres uh, that are mixed in it. There are dialogues in it, there are narratives, narrations in it, the verses of various kinds in it, uh, the rhythmic prose woven into it. And it's meant to be performed and it's not meant to be read. Though it was printed fairly early, it was one of the earliest texts to be published. I mean, there was just a four year hiatus between his composition and its publication. And it's very odd compared to, say, Tyagaraja. Tyagaraja died in 1844 or, or 1840s. The first publication of his works were in somewhere in the 20th century. So he had to wait for 60 years. But Gopal Krishna Bharati was printed almost immediately. Okay, this is based on the story of a Dalit Pulaya saint, focusing on the tension between his intense devotion to Shiva, particularly Nataraja and Chidambaram. We'll speak of Chidambaram a little more. And exclusion from access to divinity due to his caste Uh The seed story... Uh, we do not know when it happened because uh, no one tells us which century Nandana lived. Uh, he certainly lived before the 8th century. Uh, the Periyapuranam gives uh, the first developed hygiographic, I would still maintain, uh, account of uh, Nandana. Uh, it talks about his intense desire to have a darshan of Nandana hesitated entering the township of Chidambaram because it was uh, it had a very strong Brahmanic ethos around it. Uh, it still has. And he eventually goes there, but he doesn't want to enter the town. He still goes round and round the town. Shiva appears in a dream uh, and tells him that he can shed his body by entering fire and become purified. So, uh, he has to shed his Pulaya body in fire, which is lit by the Chidambaram Brahmins, and he enters the sanctum, but never to be seen again. So there are a lot of problematic dimensions in it, which we'll come to later. Uh, this is one of the earliest uh, representations of this uh, uh, incident. You can see the fire and Nandana sitting in the middle and the Chidambaram Brahmins in worshipful pose. And this uh, uh, panel was probably made some within 50 years of Periya Puranam's version. 
So this takes me back to the central concern which I am trying to explore. Uh, this combination of accessing divinity and if I were to translate it into modern terms or more broader terms, higher truths, uh, something more, mon more than mundane truths of daily existence, questioning social inequality and creating community of equals, and creation of beauty. I think these three actually make that beautiful combination which has a potential of changing the world. These three to me in Indian Bhakti movement are inseparable and they intertwine with each other. Uh, Vijaya just mentioned uh, about her own work on devotion and this and she has this beautiful volume uh, which some of which many of you may have seen. It's entitled Devotion and Descent. So I'm just adding a third dimension, which is implicit in that book, uh, aesthetics. Because all this devotion and descent is visible to us through a work of art. And but for that work of art, this would be less. And I think art plays a very central role in bringing these two together. One another thing which I plan to do with this uh, triangle is to historicize it. Uh, what I mean by historicizing is to set it in the process of history. All these three things, speculations about higher truths or about God, philosophy, uh, or nature of social reality and the process of questioning social inequality, and aesthetics, all of them have their own independent history and they have been changing. And along with this change, this combination, uh, triangular combination also has evolved and changed. This has been you know, something that interests me. I am not looking at historical figures. I am trying to look at the history of this triangle. That, to me, that is the historicizing of this process. Uh, and I believe that this ability of bhakti idea to steer through the process of change for almost 2000 years, at least 1500 years in the past, has enabled it to become an influential, an enormous influence in shaping the subcontinental history. The study will be in two parts. I think all of you have got uh, my abstract. Uh, the first part will be on the context of uh, the work, Nandana Charitra Kirtanai, and the second part will be uh, on the work itself and what uh, Gopal Krishna Bharatiya achieved. Uh, I will today probably, given the time available, focus on the first part and maybe uh, if I have the time, I will go into a little of the second part. Otherwise, we can wait for some other occasion to talk about the second part. Uh, so I begin with the evolving context for Nandana Charitri Kitane. I just wanted to apologize to Makaranji uh, that uh, I will not be taking up what happened after the composition of Gopal Krishna Bharati because that's a huge area of study and it requires a field study which uh, I am told it's not really part of the agenda of the center. Uh, so I am not really taking up that part because it's a far more complex history. I am going back now to the context which uh, shaped Nandana Charitra Kirtanai. Uh, as I told you, Nandana Charitra Kirtanai was composed in the middle of 19th century and this is the background to it. And uh, Puri is centered in the temple of Chidambaram. You, I hope you can see the small visual of Chidambaram temple, the innermost section of the temple. Chidambaram temple has been historically very important, uh, particularly because it was a focus of Tamil Shaivite Bhakti tradition uh, and immense amount of scholarship that was focused in that uh, place. 
it was a center of devotion a center of religious scholarship shaivite scholarship especially and tamil literary scholarship so it has that kind of a play I mean, it has a history of almost 1500 years of a continuous engagement with these people uh, the interesting thing about it is it became a major male brahmanic uh, religious stronghold of the shaivas and being that it was a center of immense amount of social negotiation conflict and resolution of those conflicts so 1500 years of negotiation on theological issues on social issues on aesthetic issues you can see embedded in the temple complex you can see it the this negotiation on caste gender with the state it continues to this day and you can see it embedded not only in the myths relating to the temple the texts related to the temple rituals that are enacted every day the festivals that are done every year and the very architecture and art of the temple bear the imprint of this so i think that actually makes the temple a highly incoherent structure incoherent in ritual practice incoherent in structure and this incoherence actually is a result of 1500 years of social negotiation and i think uh, situating mm -hmm. nandana charitra kirtanai in the history of this temple is very important okay that is one uh, about the temple itself because that's going to be the backdrop the spatial backdrop for this entire discussion what is happening in and around this temple um i am going to take up many uh, other transformations which are happening the post chora period roughly what you would call the transition between early modernism if you accept the use of the term early modernism for the period uh, can someone uh, unmute your the lot of background noise can please unmute your uh, mics as a lot of your mics sorry mute you. uh so i'm going to use the term loosely uh, early modernism roughly between the post chora period around 1200 onwards and to the com coming of the colonial nationalist modernism uh briefly about philosophical and theological ideas and practices centered around uh this area uh i will skip the other points i'll focus on tamil shaiva siddhanta uh, evolution uh, all these other backgrounds are mentioned here you could have a look at it but uh, shaiva siddhanta as it evolves in tamil nadu uh basically picks up the story from something like uh, see there is an all india pan indian shaiva movement uh with its own agamas and other things which is picked up eventually in kashmir and you have major doctrines being developed there in kashmir the most important figures in this uh, sadhya jyotish and then following him bhatta narayana and uh, bhatta ramakanta these are the people who develop a theology of shaivism and um, they are all in sanskrit texts one of the hallmarks of this shaiva siddhanta text is that it is trying to position itself somewhere in between the varnashrama system and questioning of the varnashrama system uh, it opens the door for shudras uh, for example they allow uh, initiating shudras and women but uh, and they also allow shudras to become gurus themselves not the women though but the shudra can only initiate another shudra a shudra will not be entitled to initiate a upper caste person so that's the kind of negotiation they do uh, with varnashrama system uh so this shaiva siddhanta was then later on 
uh, sort of marginalized by a monist uh, doctrine which develops in Kashmir, Abhinav Gupta and other people, we all heard of them. Uh, many people have worked on it in uh, uh, the institute. Uh, when it, somewhere around 13th century or 12th, uh, middle of the 12th century, we see a kind of a flowering of Shaiva Siddhanta and uh, Shaivism in Chidambaram back. Chidambaram, you have two important figures coming up around the 12th century. One is uh, uh, Maheshwar Ananda, whose Maharta Manjari was referred to by Balramji the other day. It was a section uh, which is in Maharashtri Prakrit. He had mentioned it in his talk. Uh, it's a very important attempt at synthesizing the different schools of Kashmir monist Shaivism and trying to relate it to Nataraja cult of Chidambaram. Uh, and this was being written in Chidambaram itself. Almost around the same time, there's this person called Adhora Shiva who revives the orthodox Shaiva Siddhanta which is a dualist Shaiva Siddhanta, which doesn't accept that ultimately there is only Shiva. It accepts the reality of the world. It accepts the multiplicity of the souls and it accept, accepts the supremacy of Shiva himself. So it's a uh, uh, Shaiva Siddhanta is uh, revived in uh, Chidambaram by Agora Shiva and his followers. But somewhere around the 13th century, a break comes. The break comes in the form of what we call uh, Tamilizing the tradition. They abandon Sanskrit as the vehicle of communication. And they adopt Tamil as the vehicle for uh, developing their doctrines. So a new doctrine and a new canon is formulated from the 13th century onwards, which is a Tamil canon. At the beginning of the Tamil canon, they put in the Tevaram Bhakti hymns and the hagiography I talked about, the Periya Puranam at the end of that. So this is a new canon that is formed, which is Tamil, and that canon becomes the center of Tamil Shaivism. Along with this canonical literature, a second set of canon, which is called uh, the Meikanda Shastra. This is the Shastras relating to Shaivism written in Tamil by four major writers, starting from Meikanda, who probably was a 12th century person, ending with uh, what's his name? Uh, Umapati Shivacharya uh, in the 13th century, in the beginning of 13th century. Umapati Shivacharya was the most prolific of all these. Uh, he wrote very influential works, not only in Tamil, a lot of them in Tamil, but also in Sanskrit. And uh, we are told that he was a Dikshita Brahman from the temple complex, was excommunicated for being associated with the Shaiva Siddhanta Gurus. He walks out of the temple. He becomes an important Shaiva Siddhanta leader, leading figure. Uh, we are told that he gives Diksha to two uh, kinds of people who are very different. I mean, apart from the host of uh, Shishyas which he had, he gave Diksha to a Dalit woodcutter who is to come to the temple. And he gave Diksha to his own wife. But strangely enough, both of them lose their lives. Uh, both the wife and the woodcutter. There is some problem that we can see, some tension around initiating people either from the Dalit sections or the women into uh, the Shaiva Siddhanta tradition. There is some tension around it, but he does make that kind of a move. So that is uh, the Shaiva Siddhanta uh, principle. But later on, as the Shaiva Siddhanta grows into the 16th century and 17th century, 
uh, there are yet more people coming into the picture in Chidambaram and they question caste system per se. There is a person called Nigama, uh, uh, his Tamil name is uh, Maranyana Deshikar. Uh, he is also called Veda Jnana Deshika, Veda Jnana and all that. He has two, three names. He writes his text both in Sanskrit and uh, Tamil. And for the first time, he makes an argument that caste is some is a creation of Asura Gurus to mislead human beings in Bharata Varsha. And he, as a proof of his... As a proof of his content, he argues that you do not find caste system in any other country of the world. He says you do not find it in other countries. He almost recalls a very ancient uh, art. But who put it up and all? Uska pura history nikaliye. Basically, when we were running the first meeting, it was very good. And please, uh, Dr. Paranjpe, can you mute your uh, mic? वो आपने पूरा देख लिया स्टडी कर लिया डॉक्टर पराज पे कैन यू म्यूट योर माइक प्लीज ओ आई एम सो सॉरी थैंक यू ओके सो देयर इज अ ट्रेडिशन व्हिच कंटिन्यूज टू क्वेश्चन कास्ट सिस्टम एंड वर्णाश्रम और धर्म बट आल्सो ट्राइज टू कंफर्म टू इट दिस कंफर्मेशन डायमेंशन एक्चुअली कम्स फ्रॉम Another angle, the development of Smartha Brahman ideology. Uh, one of the key figures in this, of course, is Appaya Dikshita, who negotiates between Shaiva Siddhanta and Vedanta to create a new kind of Shaiva Siddhanta Vedanta combination, which is called Chivadvaita. I will not go further into the details of this. We can discuss this. If people have questions, there are other dimensions which I have mentioned here, but I will not uh, elaborate. Them. I want to go next into the literary culture and language and performing uh, performative genres which are developing in the early modern period. Uh, Sheldon Pollock talks of the vernacular age, and one of the dimensions of it we saw in the development of a Tamil canon for Shaiva Siddha. Uh, but what is important about it is that what I think is happening is a massification of literature. Uh, formal literature, which was produced by scholars earlier, was addressed to certain class of patrons or scholars to each other. Now they are transcending this boundary of literature and trying to reach out to larger audience. And that is having its impact on the kind of literature that is produced. Which also uh, implies a larger participation of wider sections of the society in the political and literary and aesthetic processes. Um, Tamil Zwellebel and Shulman have written much about the emergence of early modernism in Indian, uh, particularly Tamil literature. Uh, Zwellebel points out a change in prosody from the ancient Sangam. Uh, kind of prosody to a matra braced prosody which enables you to write much more popular poetry uh, and also uh, link it to performative genres which are performed rather than read you know, that's very significant shift that happens here uh, the importance is that there has been folk literature folk performance all through but now you have scholarly writers writing for mass audiences so that is the shift that zwellebel is talking about and similarly uh, shulman talks of another uh, important dimension which is it is no longer a tamil world the tamil world today is uh, i mean by today i mean from the vijayanagara period onwards was inhabited by telugus kannadas persian speakers Hindi speakers, Marathi speakers. So it was, there is a rich multilingual and uh, tradition that has developed. And interestingly, 
the texts from these different languages are being translated referred to talked about discussed by the scholarly writers of this period uh, for example periya puranam now travels all the way from through uh, andhra pradesh karnataka into maharashtra now uh, we have a marathi version of periya puranam also so that and then they are referring to each other's text there is an intertextuality uh, between the language groups that is coming not just between sanskrit and the vernacular language and uh, shulman points out two other dimension which are of importance to us one is a realist dimension he talks about uh, not only greater and closer observation of nature but also more critical depiction of social realities and social tensions that you start seeing in uh, literature periya puranam if you uh, if i may say uh, uh, dalit writers have pointed this out very seriously is essentially a brahmanic ideological uh, apparatus it gives a brahmanical chola imperial view of uh bhakti cult but here now lot of new things are opened up veera shaiva movement in karnataka has opened up tremendously new areas of social protest where periya puranam text is reused uh and reworked another dimension which uh, shulman points out which is very fascinating is that we have reflexive texts texts which look upon themselves texts which reflect upon themselves and in a sense make fun of themselves and try to tell the reader not to take the text too seriously so this reflexive text which emerges in tamil literature he points out as a major new development in the uh, early modern period when you come to shift to a modern period let, let us say the coming of missionaries and the colonial administration uh you will see a very distinct prudishness there is a rejection of this whole lot of early modern literature as being very carnal or very uh, immoral uh, and rejection of this kind of a text uh which is very strange because if you look at the islamic texts which are coming in the same period islamic texts are adapting to the tamil literary tradition which is very erotic and they adopt it uh, uh your huge volume of islamic texts but when you come to christian texts there is an enormous amount of prudishness which creeps into the literary culture and that influences the 19th century uh, writers because now they are withdrawing from eroticism and trying to go back to some kind of moralizing um uh, this another major issue which i wanted to talk about early modernism is uh, uh the issue of languages tamil is a diglossic language where uh, i hope people are not to prop uh is a diglossic language where the same person will speak in a two different register at uh, the register which is more formal more appropriate for literary and formal context but when the same person talks to his own children or wife or servants or to each other they will be talking in a different register it is not just aap or tum kind of a difference it is not a dialect difference it is the same language which is spoken in different registers uh this actually creates a distance between people because most of the people who are not formally trained who are not formally regi- uh, educated do not pick up the higher register so that is one uh, social distancing which happens in the diglossic uh, linguistic structure tamil is one of the few diglossic languages in india bengali comes nearby but uh, uh linguists do not really take bengali as a diglossic language but they place tamil as a typical diglossic language uh, along with diglossia is the emergence of what i called 
the multilingual literary culture i just talked about it and the population is also multilingual because of the mis intermixture of linguistic groups which happens during the vijayanagara and the post vijayanagara period so there is literary polyglossia the um, writers a normal writer is uh, adept in at least 3 to 4 languages and literatures of 3 to 4 languages in the early modern period then yet another kind of variant of language comes which is called the kachari language which is the language of the administrative court where transaction is being done because there is a mixture of a number of languages administrative languages persian english tamil kannada telugu they are being mixed up there yet another kind of language grouping will come from different religious traditions vaishnava tradition comes with uh, what is called the manipravala tradition which has a high mixture of sanskrit christians have a very uh, ambiguous uh, kind of a language which is trying to place itself between the diglossic structure of tamil and also trying to translate the latin text into tamil so the typical problems of translation creep into the christian usage islamic texts obviously use huge number of uh, persian arabic words and it is written in arabic script and then you have the shaiva tamil so they are all competing in some ways and debating with each other which is the real tamil this period simultaneously creates anxieties over loss of purity and the higher register of tamil language and this is the time when tamil nationalism is emerging and in some ways it is fed by and fueled by the shaiva vellala community which tries to posit shaiva tamil as the standard tamil so you have a rich debate going on on the question of language okay then the performative genres um uh, this is a period when there is a major shift in literature from being just to be read by fellow uh, lit uh, literate scholars or the patrons it is meant to be addressed to all and sundry and it is to be done in the form of theater or performance so there's much has been written recently about performative literature as distinct from literary literature and i'm drawing upon this uh, this kind of scholarship uh this is particularly because they are addressing a very large audience uh, okay um the typical format chosen in this is what is called the pad and kirtane pad uh, everyone in the northern india would also be familiar it will have a take or what is called the dhruva pad and followed by the charan so a typical kabir bhajan nanak bhajan or dadu or meera bhajan is organized in the structure it basically originates from jayadeva in uh, 11th or 12th century who develops this format of uh, refrain and charan kind of uh, format and it is developed in tamil nadu between uh, tirupati where annamacharya is the first to practice it into tripartite structure or three tiered structure of pallavi anupallavi and charan uh, this is very important because pallavi is uh, is a kind of a refrain which keeps repeating so you coming back to the main theme of the idea and you explore the other dimensions of the idea in the charana anupallavi basically elaborates the pallavi idea both musically aesthetically and also in terms of the content of the idea so this three struct three level development becomes very central to carnatic music subsequently this has this begins around 17th century uh, tamil the earliest person to use it in tamil is muthu tandavar uh, who was probably around uh, 17th century uh, okay along with this kirtanai format you have 
new genres of literature which basically address mass audiences they are performed in temple festivals pallu natakam pallu uh, uh, is a kind of a uh, theater based on the lives of dalits uh, i'll not go into the details of it but all others the kuravanchi uh, deals with kuravas or the tribal people nundi natakam has a array of very interesting characters from courtesans foot soldiers cheats robbers all these people are central and uh, disabled people they are central to the nondi natakam uh, genre they are all marginal people coming into the performing genre that is emerging in the uh, early modern period and on parallel to it within the brahmanic tradition itself you have nama sankirtana tradition which is trying to reach out to the larger audience through uh, collective bhajan singing um uh, okay um so all these involve not just these are not folk literature these are literature written by serious accomplished scholars trained in long history of tamil literature and multilingual literature and a proof of this is the use of uh, literary styles and uh, theatrical styles used across the subcontinent at least in the entire deccan you will have the use of lavani khadga gawai these are all used in north indian music and uh, uh, deccani music which are adopted in tamil also uh, okay i'll skip the next part and come to the last part of my thing on the third dimension that i was going to talk about which was uh, untouchability and aggressive slave slavery and how that interacts with these three processes um uh, social structure in india particularly south india was in a flux from 13th century to 19th century uh i'll not go into the details of the social history of this period uh but i'll just talk about a little about uh dalitness or uh, the kind of dehumanization that uh untouchability specifically imposes it's an extreme form of internal othering maintained by coercion and loss of freedom and this has to be kept in mind uh this internal othering is essential to the society which uh, is based on a notion of purity and pollution and putting uh, brahmans at the top of the hierarchy if you want to have brahmans at the top of the hierarchy it is essential to have a mirror image of something which is not brahman which is the other and that other has to be within the society it cannot be you know this is what the yavanas do as earlier on it or the milechas it's some kind of a milecha within your own society that creates that contrast so it's essential to maintain that social order uh and it can only be maintained at two costs one is extreme form of coercion that is one and there's a second cost which is paid by the upper caste themselves because they have to once they conceptualize the otherness as some form of loss of humanity they have to revisualize all human beings as without humanity so this is the kind of literature you will find say in tamil bhakti movement where every saint will call himself i am the worst of the dogs you know i am not even a human being you in front of the godhead and please remember that god and the king in south indian bhakti tradition are almost equivalent so reducing a human being to a non human existence is actually a extinction of this othering of the dalits within the society okay once you other the dalits it becomes and you subject them to coercion a next extension of it is to convert them into unfree laborers to produce so this is the other dimension of south indian 
untouchability, particularly in the wet irrigated area, where you will find significantly higher proportion of Dalit population compared to other districts. So here you will find Dalits who are uh, dehumanized and forced to work under subhuman conditions in the fields of the upper caste people. And this whole system is maintained through what is called Mirasi system. Before the coming of the Persians, it used to be called the Kaniyachi system, where the landholding community as a whole has a dominating, controlling role over the community of Dalits. So it's not a kind of an individual relationship. It's a collective domination. It's a collective heritage, as many people have called it. So somewhere between the Chora period and the uh, late Vijayanagara period or Nayaka period, this collective heritage is being transformed into some kind of individual bondage or slavery. Uh, the dimensions of this process are not clear because uh, we are still trying to understand this. Uh, how collective slaves get transformed into individual slaves of individual landholders. This also happens as a parallel process to break up of collective landed property that happens in the Vijayanagara and post Vijayanagara period. But the contours of it are still not very clear. Uh, even as this process of transformation from collective heritage to some kind of a slavery is happening, uh, the Dalits are emerging into the public sphere as uh, actors. They are now part of larger political process, which basically means that there is a major change in the position. What exactly that means, I still need to uh, work it out for myself. That because the Dalits are emerging in literature, I told you about the Pallu literature. They are emerging in uh, the uh, rituals of temples. They uh, become the major people who are to pull the temple chariots. They have an important role in various temple functions. Their role in the public sphere is increasing. We find the Dalits uh, being mentioned as witnesses in major inscriptional uh, transactions. So there is a shift. And we also see for the first time, Dalit women become visible. In Pallu literature and other literature, you start seeing Dalit women. In fact, one of the most fascinating lit piece of literature is a Telugu piece written by a Maratha king in uh, Tanjau, where he talks about a Brahmin falling in love with a Dalit woman and he's trying making advances on her. And that is the story. And this is supposed to be performed in a temple festival. So this is the Dalit women are becoming more and more visible. Now with the coming of the British, with the coming of Islam, with the coming of missionaries, you have new gazes on this whole phenomenon of untouchability, new frames of looking at it, new methods of measuring untouchability and the conditions of Dalit. Uh, briefly, I think I'm finishing my time, so I'll briefly go over uh, okay i'll skip this part you can many of you have the text with you i'll uh, probably end here and just say that gopalakrishna bharati was situated in this context there's a transformation of theological philosophical ideas giving rise to shivadvaita form of smarta brahmanism a kind of Vedanti sized Shaiva Siddhanta uh, on the one hand, on the other, and which also incorporates huge amounts of Tantric uh, Shaktaism also in it. That is the theological philosophical development, uh, which is also simultaneously questioning caste system and trying to make it more accommodative. Uh, then we have a major uh, transformation in the literary culture. Uh, where I called it a massification of literature and emergence of early modern trends. And thirdly, a transformation of 
the untouchability and uh, agrestic slavery which in some ways is giving rise to a greater present public presence of dalits and it is in this and the emergence of colonialism which is bringing totally new perspectives now colonialism relies on the landlords and doesn't want to disturb agrarian slavery it doesn't want to disturb uh, untouchability operating in the uh, ground real but at the same time it is disturbing to them uh, ideologically to find human beings treated so so there is a tension both within the british administration within the missionary establishment and people uh, associated with that it is in this context that gopalakrishna bharatiyar is writing his text uh, what he does with it i'll leave for a, another occasion thank you vijaya can you take this over yeah thank you very much um, subud that was an amazingly multidimensional presentation um i would like to share with you some of my uh, concerns uh one is the idea about you know how these saint poets someone like gopal krishna bharati whether he was um really truly anxious about let's say social inequalities whether um social transgression or social dissent is a product of engagement with society which is in a sense a very secular enterprise or whether it is a fallout perhaps not even intended of a journey towards transcendence please look at this question very carefully i do not know whether let's say someone like um, Uh, you know tukaram or someone like chakkamela or someone like gopal krishna bharati were really concerned about you know social inequalities or social inequities they were much more concerned with chedambaram with the whole idea of transcendence but in the process in the process of that march towards transcendence there is a shattering of social liminalities i would like you to consider that you know it's it's about uh, putting posing the question very differently and this is something that i encounter time and again when i've been working on this i still continue to encounter um a couple of other major observations and then i will uh, open it and i'm sure we can go on till five um one is the whole issue of nandanar charitram nandanar charitram has multiple renditions because if you think think of the uh, in you know, ordeal by fire that uh, nandanar was made to uh, kind of purify himself through fire and emerged as a quote unquote vedic man what does it change it changes nothing it changes nothing at all because unless you are a brahmin you cannot approach god is that what he was trying to say i doubt it very much if he emerged as what he was a free, a free soul that is neither parayan or pulayan or brahmin then you are actually making a major statement and i think that's the importance of nandanar charitram hmm? so we do not know whether these are brahmin interpolations or whether they are trying to brahminize you know like kanapa kanapa nayanar let me give you a parallel from the vaishnava tradition and tirupan alvar tirupan alvar was also someone who was not allowed to enter the temple he was a low caste he was a panal and the priest of the temple was forced to carry tirpan alvar on his shoulders and carry him into the temple so this is dissent in my opinion and i think our people have been playing around with the nandanar charitram for a very long time and let me give you a third dimension about nandanar charitram is that the 19th century was also the period of the nationalist movement in southern india as well as everywhere else and the nandanar charitram was being staged sometimes in order to uh, showcase social protest so just as they did with many of the you know things like ali rani so this is something that was happening at the, at the level of the theater theater was also politically deeply involved in the politics of that period and that's something i would like you to consider um i would also like to um, 
point out to you, I mean, this, uh, this is something that you already uh, kind of drawn attention to, is the role of the Tanitamuriyakam, the Tamil uh, separatist movement. Uh, and before I say that, I would like to um, go along with you when you say that the Tamil language had inputs from Kannada, from Telugu, from Sanskrit, from Marathi. Of course, all these languages are a part of it. And so any attempt to distill pure Tamil out of this was a very artificial exercise, which is what the Tanitamil Yekam was trying to do. And Tanitamil Yekam at the political level was talking about Tamil separatism, eventually leading on to linguistic nationalism. But at the religious level, it tied up with Saiva Siddhanta. Hmm? So yeah. this kind of a nexus is something that I would like you to explore further. Um, you know, the term Kacheri, I would, uh, again, as a follow-up of what I already said, that every language is an admixture of so many words. You cannot distill anything pure out of it. So you have something like Chit Kacheri, even like playing cards together was called Chit Kacheri. Listening to music together, part of Kacheri. So the word Kacheri was very widely used as a place where people congregated and probably spoke in different tongues. Um, so these were some of my comments. I could uh, come back to it later if there is time. And I'm sure people like Hitendra are waiting to ask questions uh, because like me, he's a historian and I'm sure there are others who would like to ask questions from other angles. So it's open to the floor. Thank you. Thank you. And please, just one minute. If I do not follow the questions, I do not know who is asking. Don't. It is not any deliberate attempt to miss out anybody. It's just because I'm not very clear as to where I stand. Yeah, so please go on. And Murli, uh, sorry, Subhu, you can handle it. Yeah. But uh, how do I figure out who is asking a question? Uh, Maybe anyone can, can start. I, Someone can. No, just to begin, yeah. uh, can you hear me, sir? Uh, I can hear you. Uh, is that uh, yeah, I... It just continuing the discussion and yeah, yeah. Uh, just continuing the discussion and obviously it's a very scholarly presentation and it it is it is uh, it uh, opens up a lot of questions <clears throat> but for me uh, the basic question is which uh, is a continuing in a way continuation of what Vijaya has Vijaya Ramaswamy has uh, already uh, stated that this kind of a take uh, actually brings into, into focus one basic question. And that question is uh, the human consideration towards the Dalits, removing the uh, Nandi and coming <clears throat> and, and giving access to the wisdom or equality or whatever, uh, uh, new kind of aesthetics, whatever you say. Was it uh, coming from good Brahmins who are deeply rooted in their own devotional exercises or some kind of transcendence or whatever you call it? Was it coming due to that or it was because of the social engagement or the kind of pressures which can emanate from society to put pressure. This is, for me, this is the basic question. And uh, uh, when I, when I, when I uh, expect someone from, from someone from you, uh, a, a different kind of a take on this whole subject, uh, I get slightly disappointed because uh, essentially, uh, this presentation does not look into it very differently from what, what Western scholars have seen it, the way Western scholars have seen it. Uh, looking at this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of engagement with a text of 1860 and getting back to those kind of theoretical discussions actually do not give us much. I expect, expect uh, from you uh, the the other kind of engagement, and which is that okay, this, this, these uh, these these saints had been rooted in, the, in in a religious tradition, and there were certain kind of developments taking place in the 12th century, 13th century, uh, and thereafter. But 
in that context, what were the real experiences of people about whom we are more interested in this kind of engagement? How Dalit's lives had been uh, changing. You, you, you mentioned uh, in the last part of your presentation some of the key issues in which you talked about a woodcutter and woman and their uh, deaths and, and certain kind of, certain kind of uh, understanding or certain kind of remembrance uh, that can be related to uh, some texts or whatever evidences the historian can look for. Those things are most important in our engagement because otherwise, when you re, uh, when you come to a 1860 situation, you always have to fall back on the forces like missionaries, different kind of a different kind of uh, understanding of relationship and status of untouchable. It, it is bound to come. So I would like you to be uh, more. Uh, engage, uh, engaged with the tradition, because these people come from that tradition, religious tradition. And, and a reader like us would like you to come out with, a, with an answer that was this tradition capable of becoming more human towards Dalits, or was it because the pressures which came from, came with the forces of Versus such as colonial, uh, colonial intervention in that. That is a question that is troubling me because uh, some other works are there in which this whole regenerating or transformatory forces are emanating within the tradition, religious tradition itself. And for that, we will have to write the religious history of, 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 of the region very differently, in which the, the 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 protest and devotion that I mean uh, the, the the space for uh, Dalits in the religion religious re, <coughs> religious tradition is, can come uh, more strongly. I, I I may not be uh, clear to you, but uh, no. I would like you to be more. I got your point. Vijay, yeah. uh, I respond in uh, the you, or how do you want? I think. To uh, no, no, you can certainly, maybe you can take one more question and then respond. Um, uh, would you like to do that or would you like to respond to both of us immediately or would you like to take one more question? Maybe you can take another question. I think uh, broadly this theme has come. Uh, so let us address this theme okay. and we can take right. questions on other themes. Uh, see, I go back to Kabir. Okay, question one, uh, which Vijaya had asked. Uh, the issue of transcendence. It's not just Kabir, but a host of Bhakti poetry after 14th century. He come with a very remarkable formulation, uh, which Kabir encapsulates and which is repeated by a number of other people. Kabira soi peer hai, jo jane par peer. To transcend yourself, to become a peer, you have to know the pain of the other person. You have Vaishnava Janato, you have Tukaram saying similar things much later. But this sentiment that transcending religious identity, religious position for yourself, the root to it lies in understanding the pain of others. I think this sensitivity to fellow human being pain and that as a vehicle for your own transcendence, I think becomes very persistent in the later, at least to the extent I understand in the later Bhakti movement. Uh, later Bhakti movement, I would say Kabir onwards or that phase of Bhakti movement. Just a minute, um, Subhu, I think even the Varkari movement, the Varkari movement, the Varkari movement in Maharashtra, it's a very, very powerful example. So it's not that they were not engaged with the pain of others. All that I'm saying no, is that there was no... The, no. I'm just stating the idea. All Bhakti movement, yeah. there, even if you go to Tevaram Tiruvasakam, there is this... But I'm saying articulating this idea, which Kabir encapsulates, 
that happens around this time whether how they did it practiced it before i would so i think that issue uh, of transcendence so to me um, hitendra ji uh, my whole project is actually to see how <coughs> caste changes <coughs> over uh, you know the later part of indian history let's say till see by 19 1860 people like gopal krishna bharti are not really products of colonial mindset they are actually in the margins of colonialism they may be you know, interacting with colonialism certainly <clears throat> their concerns their uh, roots lie in the tradition through which they come the tradition of music the tradition of theology the tradition of smarta thing and the ritual and religious practices in punjab and also the literary culture i talked about but this literary culture is not product of colonialism at all it is a product of the vijayanagara post vijayanagara social history uh, i locate the emergence of dalits as public actors as not someone confined to the tinda cheri which you find in the Pure period. They are becoming more and more public. Their public presence is see that um, issue that you raised about is it a product of a good Brahmin mindset or is it part is it a result of some social pressure? To me, there is a social pressure which the public emergence of the Dalits is posing. so whether i am a good brahmin or a bad brahmin i cannot ignore it and a sensitive brahmin like gopalakrishna bharati cannot you know keep himself away from it and he tries to find the solution to this problem in the tradition that he is <coughs> inheriting he is looking back to nandana he is looking back to upamanyu's uh, uh, bhakta vilasa is looking back to tevaram and tiruvasagam to find the solution to this problem so to me the solution is not coming here on the other hand the when you look at the missionary mindset vis a vis the dalits it's exact reflection or exact mirroring of the kind of mindset which gopal krishna bharatiya exhibits the mindset is very simple that you may be laboring for the upper caste in the fields fair enough but you have an access to spiritual good you have an access to spirituality and higher truths of life so in a sense they gopal krishna bharti doesn't denounce caste system periya puranam did not denounce caste system uh, nandanar had to shed his physical body to enter the temple period of periya puranam repeatedly talks of his body as a defiled body his kula as a defiled <coughs> kula which cannot enter the sacred he has to shed it and when he sheds it he becomes the whatever you know muni or whatever rishi goes in but very interestingly in 20th century people have recorded this the dalit versions of the story in the oral tradition this is very fascinating there is no fasting through the fire episode he rushes through into the sanctum yeah? that is one dalit version even much earlier you go to the veera shaiva uh, rendering of the story you talked about many nandana stories there is a veera shaiva uh, in palkurki somanatha <coughs> composition uh, pandita rajya charitamu there is this beautiful and extremely radically anti brahmanic anti caste uh, text which does not include any fire uh, passing through fire episode he god orders the chidambaram brahmins to take an elephant and put him on the elephant and take him inside the temple like tirupanalvar <coughs> you mentioned so it is actually uh, he is basically drawing upon a very long tradition of engaging with this problem i don't know whether um, i don't know how i gave the impression 
that Gopal Krishna Bharatiya's so-called social radicalism emerges from his engagement with colonialism. On the contrary, I think the Christian missionaries <coughs> have the same mindset. They said that we are to separate the civil and the spiritual of the Dalits. Dalits are not capable of spiritual attainment because they are deprived of education, they are deprived of the company of upper caste. So Dalits cannot even convert to Christianity. So they, when massive number of Dalits convert to Christianity, the <coughs> Adris, uh, some of the important uh, Christian missionaries argue there is a movement but this is not a conversion. You know, how can they be converted? They don't have the mind prepared spiritually to be converted. So there is actually a notion that Dalits are deprived and they are not capable of reaching. That's a missionary mindset. Of course, there are other missionaries. There are lots of, within missionaries, there is massive debate going on about how to deal with the Dalit question. And it heats up between 1890s and uh, uh, 1910s. So that, that's a different set of debate I'll not go into. Predominant missionary uh, attitude towards Dalits is one of deep suspicion of their ability to actually even become good Christians. Sorry. I... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Prabhu, I think I would just like to come in for a minute. Um, you know, this, uh, the conversion question is something that you'll have to uh, look into deeper because we're looking for numbers and Dalits made very good numbers. If you look at the Mukavar community or like I call it, they were converting them en masse. You know, it didn't matter what they believed in, what they can, eventually they would have separate views in the church. But for, for uh, in terms of numbers, they are very important. I think we have a question here from Professor Chahal and probably one from Professor Narayanan. Uh, Professor Chahal's question is, how would you contextualize non-Brahmin movements <coughs> which are around the same time in Bombay and Madras presidencies vis-a-vis -vis your research on Nandanar Charitra? And uh, Professor Narana, I think, could articulate his own question. No, but can I so, respond to Chael's question? Professor, certainly. Um, yeah, uh, certainly, please. One of the backdrops for my study will be Ayodhya Dasar. Ayodhya Dasar is one of the earliest um, Dalit activists. And... Uh, <clears throat> He is active from 1870 onwards and around 1868 or 1870 comes out with a manifesto which says Dalits are not Hindus and he begins his work. He goes to Chennai, meets a theosophists who introduce him to the Sri Lankan Buddhists. He gets converted to Buddhism <coughs> and he recasts the whole narrative about Dalits in South India. Uh, and he writes prolifically till uh, his death in 1914. So this will be one of the contrasting points where I would like to compare what I'll call internal Brahmanic attempt at handling the Dalit question and a Dalit protest uh, angle about handling the Dalit question and the Dalit's relation. The same Nandanar story <coughs> is retold by Ayodhi Dasar in a Buddhist term, which is very fascinating, but I will not uh, go into it now because it's a very complicated uh, exercise to uh, see how uh, Ayodhya Dasar reinterpreted the Nandana story as the story of a Buddhist king who was killed by the Brahmins. So that's a different kind of a story. But, uh, but that narrative is going to be a, a backdrop to understand Nandana Charitra. Uh, Professor yes. can, uh, can you hear me, Subhu? Yeah, very well, please. Thank, thank, thank you, Subhuji, for a really fascinating presentation. Uh, all the more so because uh, uh, I'm very interested in music, in Carnatic music also, and uh, the history of music. So if I may just uh, kind of divert the discussion a little bit away from uh, the historians and history, uh, we have a plethora of them. So uh, let's 
try to kind of uh, shift it a little bit towards the question of music. Uh, one thing that I have noticed, uh, and it's not just with Carnatic music alone, but in the whole of South India, I think it applies to North India too. The entire Bhakti movement has been primarily performative in nature and also quite steeped in what one would call a popular culture of music. And where the music, the form of the music itself, probably much more so than what it actually says, in terms of content, in terms of uh, the devotional content that is present there, the form of the music itself and the form of the performance itself made it accessible, not just to an elite or a Brahminical audience, but to what one would call a populace at large. And this was where the, the real breakthrough or the real shift uh, of the aesthetic culture comes in. And when you actually take up the question of, uh, as you said, the creation of beauty, I would probably suggest, I would suppose that you might want to look at what are the paradigm shifts that actually takes place in the, on the aesthetic plane. For example, one, one, little, one little point which can be looked at is that this is uh, one of the major uh, opera operas called the Nadaka which, uh, in, in the Carnatic music canon. Uh, the earlier two being uh, Nauka Charidam and uh, uh, Bhakti Vijayam, both by Tyagaraja, and this comes around 50 years later. Now, one thing that has always intrigued me is, what about the form? In fact, if you look at Tyagaraja, continuing on with the Sampradaya Bhajan, the Nama Sangeetana tradition, which actually percolated down into Tamil Nadu from the Maratha regions, and in which more than the musical element, so to speak, musical element in the sense, the, the formal musical element, it was much more the ideas that were being uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, you, being communicated. But with Tyagaraja, the form of the music, especially in terms of the operatic tradition, becomes important. Now, what about Gopalakrishna Bharati? Is there a considerable shift or a change in that musical form, in the form of the opera itself, where in a, in, a, in a certain manner of speaking, it is not just in the ideas that are being expressed. It is not just probably in the way in which the devotion of Nandira is being expressed, but much more so in terms of the musical form that it gets altered, where the change takes place within the tradition itself. The reason I'm asking this is because, for example, if you were to go a little bit further back, the case of Kathakali as a performance genre, Kathakali is also credited with the idea of actually making devotion a non-Brahminical uh, and, and even the, the temple uh, premises or the temple culture itself non-ritualistic and much more based on devotion. But in a strange manner of speaking, even while such accessibility was clearly there, in a latent fashion it was also buttressing the caste divisions, the hierarchies, by a particular format of costuming and makeup which clearly followed this, uh, you know, top-down, uh, uh, you know, system of, right. of gradation, so to speak. So I'm just wondering whether a look into the form of this, this particular work, whether it departs from Tyagarajas or whether it departs from the musical tradition, would offer the possibility, as you said, of looking at the shifts and or whether there is a deeper ambivalence that is present there. As you said, Nandina uh, doesn't, uh, Puntanam, for, ex for example, was able to go uh, with his body into heaven because he was a Brahmin. But Nandina cannot do that. He has to cast aside his, his body if he, if he wants to keep the sanctum sanctum. So I think that ambivalence may probably also be very indicative of what one would call that modern, that moment of modernity. That moment of modernity where you want to turn away from tradition, you want to re, re, re reconsider tradition, but at the same time, you're also held back by certain aspects of that tradition. Um, well, thank you. This is not a question, uh, just, yeah. uh, because it's a very interesting question, and I've been uh, thinking a lot about this. So, so can I just come in for just one minute? Yeah, please. Just to add to the point, because you have Tyagaraja's Kritis, which are structured. You have Pallavi, Anupallavi, you have Charanam, which you pointed out. But you have the Nauka Charitram, which is not structured. Similarly, Gopalakrishna Bharati has Nadanar Charitram, which is 
performative, but you also have his kritis which are structured. So the same composer he is using two different genres. Would you also like to respond to that? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I have not studied Nauka Charisamu very carefully, so I cannot uh, do not want to comment on that. Uh, but the other issues I would see there is a parallel process of transformation happening in Carnatic music. Uh, let me say between 19th and 20th century, there is a major shift. In 18th and 19th century, Carnatic music was essentially practiced by Devadasis and Melakaras. And most of these performances were supposed to be enacted by these people, Melakarans and uh, these people, and ex by extension to our other range of people century or in the beginning of 19th century, you have the Bhagavata Mela being initiated in Melatur. You have this Nama Sankirtana tradition coming in. And there is a major shift in the patronage to musicians. So there is a Brahmanization of Carnatic music which is happening. There is one very fascinating shift and the Brahmanization is not only affecting the caste composition of who is singing, <clears throat> but it is also impacting the theorization of music, A, and B, the performative structure of music. Uh, whatever happened, Nauka Charitamu never gets performed. Nandana Charitra Kirtana is never performed as Nandana Charitra Kirtana as an opera at all. Compositions from Nandana Charitra Kirtana are lifted and made into part of a concert. So Nandana Charitra Kirtana itself is never performed except probably in some kind of Harikatha kind of a tradition, which is very rare now. Carnatic music actually uh, removes uh, Bharatiya's compositions from their context. Of the can I can I can I just interject a little bit here? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, there have been attempts to actually perform Nauka Charitra, uh, even in the 19th century and of late, I mean, from the 1980s onwards, there have been several attempts to actually uh, uh, perform Nauka Charitra. Probably not Prahlada Bhakti Vijaya, but Nauka Charitra has been. And and the interesting thing about it is that whether it was actually conceived as a performative opera or merely the form of an opera in actual performance someone like Sida Rajan for instance who has, who has actually helped doing that it is clearly uh, uh, proved its value as something that can be uh, called a proper uh, musical drama a proper operatic musical drama uh, it has actually proved that so how Nandana would fare that way uh, Nandana Charitra I'm not sure Thanks for that because, but I would still put that in the experimental category. People are trying to experiment with trying to recreate uh, Nauka Charita. I mean, if I'm not missed, I have seen one or two performances of this kind, but not many. Yeah. Uh, what happens to Nandana Charitra Kirtanai? If you look at Nandana Charitra Kirtanai as a composition, it has a wide genre of literary and musical forms. Uh, I at one point I listed some 18 or 20 forms, including Lavani, Khadga. These are now not even used in North India. Gawai. If you look at it, it's, there is a form called Gawahi, which was used in this. Lavani, he is using it. He is using Khayal. So he is using a huge repertoire of popular uh, operatic or performing genres. Today, all these are extinct. You ask a Carnatic musician, musician, what is a Daru and what is a Lavni and what is a Khadga and what is a Nondi Chindu, they are not going to be able to differentiate between them. They will all sing it as a Kirtani. So that Kirtanification of all the compositions and uh, marginalization of others, I think that is also because Nandana Charitra Kirtanai and other such performative genres were meant for mass audiences, which was a multi caste, multi ethnic, multi religious community. 
when you shift from that to a very exclusive middle class brahmanic uh, audience there is a shift i mean this is my guess and i want to really go into this question and see sorry subhu i think you are i think you are conflating the carnatic music tradition you need to go into it further because you have a lot of you have the javali you have the padam you have the tirupugal you have the nundi chindu all of which is still being sung and it is a part of you know because ultimately unless something is interesting the audience will go there's nothing brahmanical about it so i think and mind you also have the tamil say sangam which also was operating around the same time but anyway that's a different question uh, please can please, i raise a question please comment. there is one it's comment and one question question. question question please subhu sir just a minute uh, just a minute uh, professor raju just a minute yeah uh, there is a, there is a comment here maybe you would like to take it up after professor raju's question about a dalit saint ramdas and i think it's a tradition from uh, the puri tradition dardyata bhakti i don't know i do not know who the questioner is the name is not coming up so please ask who is the questioner to ask this question and of course over to professor raju yeah thank you professor raju uh yes i have a few uh, points to make i was a bit puzzled about it this is not my field of course so uh, uh, one thing that was stated some along the line that caste is something unique to india that's wrong caste exists very much in africa and they don't want to get rid of it and a number of revolutionaries have discussed it so i think that needs to be corrected number one second point that Uh, i wanted to make is that uh, you talk to uh, missionaries now you talk to missionaries over a wide range of time missionaries come in the 16th century and uh, you are talking of colonial administration they are not uh, no at the yeah sorry uh, what i, I 18th, late 18th century it comes in uh, colonial administration comes into uh, madras and so on to the south around that time but what i would like to say is there seems to be a statement that uh, somehow missionaries were very uncomfortable you know you have slavery persisting in united states at that time and people are writing a bible defense of slavery and popes are very happy with it and they have not yet withdrawn those things what are we talking about they are very happy with slavery apartheid persisted uh, even after that till 1991 what exactly is the discomfort that the missionary felt the missionary actually did not want to have the rich because the pope said they are not influential we want to capture india how can you capture it by converting the lower caste people that was the kind of uh, tussle that took place when uh, this chap uh, what's his name uh, uh, this uh, Italian missionary came de nobly and pretended to be a uh, Italian Brahmin and therefore learned the way and so on this was the kind of thing that was taking place they tried to convert Akbar and so on they wanted royalty they wanted elites they were not interested they wanted uh, the, you know they wanted the empire they were not interested in converting the slaves how are they going to get something to convert people from lower levels so that was their concern not that you know whether they are spiritually prepared they are purely materialistic so maybe you would like to comment on that uh thanks for both the interjections um uh, we talked about caste in africa uh i was rather startled and surprised to know that untouchability was practiced in france as late as beginning of 20th century the entrance for that category of people i forget the name of those category of people uh oh, we are practicing it today in covid days <laughs> we are practicing it today uh, that's good for us but uh, untouchable no un- uh, segregating a community as untouchable is not something very unique but there are what may be marginal in other areas is very central to our identity Right, this statement about caste being unique to India is not mine. It is a statement by a 16th century or 17th century Shaiva Siddhanta writer. So I, I was just quoting him uh, that he was arguing that this obnoxious thing is not God-made; that it is made by us. So 
so <laughs> that is one uh, about missionaries uh, i agree with you to some extent in the sense that uh, missionaries did not have any problem with slavery or untouchability in that sense uh, and they were focusing uh, on and give me just the people who were indentured laborers yeah. who were taken all across the world yeah yeah so they had no issues with all that uh, but the fact is that there are missionaries and missionaries within the missionaries you have a debate i mean i'll have some names uh, at some point i can tell you who consistently campaigned for the rights of the dalits within the christian church there was this gentleman i forget his name that missionary who insisted that when you enter the church you should keep your caste identity out and the other missionaries ganged up against him and removed him from post because they found his position very untenable with the upper caste converts so it is that there are missionaries and missionaries some missionaries are very uncomfortable with caste but on the whole the entire missionary establishment is uncomfortable about having too many dalits in their fold that is equally true because they are actually targeting for the upper caste because they think that is a road to converting india having too many dalits meant the upper castes are going to go away and they are going to say that this is the religion of dalits so we have nothing to do with it therefore the missionaries were very uh, wary about converting people but like vijay is saying there were phases when dalits forced the missionaries to convert them they came in troves and said that now we are come to you you convert us that is also happening so these are all complicated thing i cannot reduce it to mission one missionary culture so just as there is brahmanic culture and brahmanic culture there is missionary culture and missionary culture um so who i think there are just two or three closing questions that comment by somebody which is a very interesting comment the person has not come back so i don't know who it is but professor hitendra patel would like to come in again so if there are no more questions then you can ask professor hitend again to come in and then we can uh, close the session so let's say another 7 8 minutes more okay sir <clears throat> thank you thank you yes in fact in fact i must say that uh, it's a it's a very very important project and I, as i expect much from this work that is why i'm i'm raising these questions i i i i i love the presentation and and there are so many ways in which it can enrich us uh, i'm very uh, very uncomfortable with uh, what i call uh, scholarship in rajal uh, in which the main question remains unanswered and so many other things do come in My, for me the basic question that is related to it is that uh, the traditions possibilities in tradition to negotiate with these questions related to the <coughs> dalits and uh, unfortunately <clears throat> bhakti tradition or bhakti movement itself has not been adequately uh, adequately uh, studied and and this is my impression i'm not an expert of that field but this is my impression that uh, if we go back to bhakti movements literature you will find lot of things uh, which are there which can help us to understand the 19th century text of this kind it, the, the bhakti movements uh, i mean literature was not predominantly produced by brahmins and in fact no bhakt poet or the bhakt literature uh, was uh, was 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 against the dalits as such in fact a lot of materials are there in fact we selectively use kabi and and in in fact pose if you, you you must be familiar with kabir versus tulsidas debate and all that even tulsidas even within what is what what are called the traditional people brahminical supportive of brahminical varnar some sort of thing they also had a very very interesting kind of considerations which have not been studied so far so i would uh, i would have loved to see 
the the traditional traditional uh, sources in order to understand the 19th century text in a bigger way rather than going into some uh, external forces which are have been over over uh, emphasized in the historical literature we always go back to those kind of scholarships in, and try to relate with that i ex i expect you to uh, because you are capable of that and i expect you to locate these questions in that tradition which you have already mentioned when you have answered my question that indian tradition whatever i'm not brahminical tradition i'm talking about in 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 indian literature produced by bhats bhat poets we have enough to understand why these kind of sentiments did exist and there were so many kind of things which were there at one point i i, I need your uh, certain clarification uh, you must have thought about it that dalits could be part of it but dalit can initiate only dalits you mentioned at one point that dalits could be part of it but dalits could only initiate dalits only on what basis you have said it sorry and, and it, question, i missed that question last question you you mentioned that uh, there was uh, there was a situation in which dalits could be part of it i mean part of the uh, one one kind of a system where dalits could be part of that saiva siddhanta saiva siddhanta yeah 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 but they could initiate only dalits no not dalits sorry shudras Okay, I mean, sorry, I mean, I, I was using this. Uh, yeah, shudras could only. Uh, or Indian traditions differentiate between shudras and antyajas. They don't put them on same plat. Uh, maybe, maybe you are right, but it, I, I'm, but I'm, I'm raising these questions just in order to put back the focus on on Indian traditional literature, which I believe that they have not been given adequate attention, scholarly attention. That is what I'm emphasizing on. selective use of kabir would not work bring in other 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 writers also it is what uh, my suggestion uh, i am so uh, just a minute yeah um, professor madhav hada has a question or i think please. alka tyagi have a question okay. you can take it and then come uh, respond okay. to hiten assistant including sure. including comment yeah so uh, yeah if there is any question from professor hada उन्नीसवी शताब्दी के टेक्स्ट को लेकर काम कर रहे हैं हाँ जी उसका नायक उसका नायक संत भक्त की हैसियत में है और वो सदियों से है और दलित है जी ये अपने आप में इस बात का प्रमाण है कि हमारी परंपरा में दलितों के लिए गुंजाइश निरंतर है ये मान के एक दूसरा आपने एक पद शब्द इस्तेमाल किया है ये उत्तर भारत के सभी संत भक्त इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं पदों का हमारे यहाँ सभी लेकिन आपने पद को सीधा जयदेव से जोड़ा है लेकिन इससे पहले ये बौद्धों के चर्या गीतों में जी बिल्कुल दूसरा पद का सीधा संबंध संगीत शास्त्र के प्रबंध से है और वो उसके जो भाग हैं ध्रुव मेलापक उदग्रह आभोग ध्रुव उसका पहला चरण है और वो अंत ध्रुव से शुरू होता है कोई पद और ध्रुव से ही समाप्त होता है आभोग उसका अंतिम चरण है जिसमें उसके रचनाकार का नाम भी आता है आलवार संत जिस आलवार संत इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं इस इस पद का और उनके ग्रंथ का नाम ही तमिल प्रबंध वो नारियार प्रबंधम है पूरा का पूरा इसलिए इसका सीधा संबंध जयदेव से नहीं है मुझे लगता है ये परंपरा बहुत पुरानी है एक और जानकारी जो मुझे जिज्ञासा है मेरे मन में वो क्या है कि आपका जो आ, आपकी रचना का जो नायक है वो नायनार संत नायनार परंपरा से आता है मैं ये जानना चाहता हूं कि क्या आलवारों और नायनारों के बीच में विचार और वर्चस्व को लेकर कोई प्रतिद्वंदिता थी क्या बिल्कुल क्यों नहीं 
धन्यवाद हाडा जी के मुद्दे से शुरू करता हूँ मुझे आ, संगीत के इतिहास में और खासकर उत्तर भारत में संगीत के जो टेक्स हैं उन्होंने आ, गायन को किस तरह से स्ट्रक्चर किया ये जानने की जरूरत है और आ, शायद आपके साथ बैठ के अलग से मैं इसको समझने की कोशिश करूंगा जो मैंने कोशिश की जितना मैंने देखा था उसमें ये जो ध्रुव पद है यानी कि टेक जिसे कहते हैं कबीर के पदों में टेक गाना फिर चरण गाना फिर चरण गा के फिर वापस टेक पे आना फिर आगे ये जो ढांचा है ये मुझे लगा कि जयदेव के पदों से शुरू होता है ये लगातार वापस टेक पे आना यानी कि ध्रुव पद पे आना ये मैं सोच रहा था कि जयदेव से पहले मुझे दिखा नहीं पद या चरण तो मिलते हैं लेकिन क्या आ, ये ढांचा क्या ये ढांचा बहुत बहुत दिनचर्या गीतों में इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं तो वो मैं समझना और उत्तर भारत में उत्तर भारत में बाद में इसको भजन कहा जाने लगा जी आप यदि गुरु, गुरु ग्रंथ साहब में जाएंगे तो वहां भी यही पद्धति अपनाई गई है उत्तर भारत के सारे संत भक्त यही इस्तेमाल कर रहे बाद ये तो सब में दिखता है ये कहा जी जी अच्छा दूसरी बात जो आपने शैव और वैष्णव की बात की थी कि शैव और वैष्णव के बीच मैं मैं शैव और वैष्णव नायनार और आलवार आ, क्या नायनार और आलवार के बीच में कुछ कथानक उसमें तो मैंने कभी ध्यान से मैं देखा नहीं, नहीं। आ, आपका नायक एक नायनार संत है तो मैं मैं इतना इनके बारे में हमारे जानकारी है वो नायनारों के जियोग्राफी जो उनके संप्रदाय में लिखे गए उनसे पता लगता है या आलवारों के उनमें डायरेक्ट कंफ्रंटेशन इन दोनों के मुझे तो नहीं दिखे डायरेक्ट कंफ्रंटेशन उस समय समकालीन कंफ्रंटेशन जो होता है जैन संप्रदाय से होता है बौद्ध संप्रदाय से होता है वैष्णव और शैवों के बीच में इतना था ये मैं आलवार और नायनार संप्रदाय में मैंने नहीं देखा लेकिन तुरंत बाद चोर काल में ये बहुत ही प्रतिद्वंदी रिश्ते में थे चिदंबरम मंदिर खुद इसका गवाही है कि उसका जो आर्किटेक्चर है उसके अंदर जो अलग अलग खंड है उसमें तुरंत दिखता है ये झगड़े का एक तरह से निराकरण का प्रयास वहां दिखता है तो ये प्रतिद्वंदिता दोनों संप्रदाय में है लेकिन आड़वार और नायनारों में रहा ऐसे मुझे दिखा नहीं है मैं फिर से देखना पड़ेगा ध्यान से आपके सवाल को लेके अच्छा ए, ए, एक और बात बता मैं 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 जानना चाहता हूं कि क्या आलवार संत शंकराचार्य के अद्वैतवाद की प्रतिक्रिया में रामानुजाचार्य वगैरह सारे लोग विष्णु स्वामी वगैरह क्या शैवों के यहां भी ये प्रतिक्रिया है नहीं देखिए आड़वार संप्रदाय जो है जो 4000 दिव्य प्रबंधम जिसका आपने उल्लेख किया ये प्राय या तो शंकराचार्य के पहले के हैं या शंकराचार्य के आगे पीछे होंगे बहुत ज्यादा ये कहना कि शंकराचार्य से ये प्रभावित हुए ये कहना मुश्किल है लेकिन नम्माड़वार नम्माड़वार जरूर वेदांत से प्रभावित है वेदांत अलग अलग तरीके से उन तक पहुंच सकता है अद्वैतवाद से ही पहुंचे ये जरूरी नहीं नम्बाड़वार में बिल्कुल ये देखते हैं इसी तरह माणिक कवास अगर को जब हम देखते हैं उनमें भी वेदांत का काफी गहरा प्रभाव दिखता है शंकराचार्य का अद्वैतवाद का मायावाद का प्रभाव था या नहीं ये बहुत स्पष्ट नहीं है मेरे ख्याल से आ, 
ये थोड़ा नहीं सारे अलवार उसकी प्रतिक्रिया में प्रभु उसके प्रतिरोध में है लगभग So okay, it's a okay. very, very interesting question. Very interesting question. We can carry on. I have a very important yeah. question. Yeah. What about the samosas and tea? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Can I uh, can I uh, Subhu, with your permission, uh, make the closing comments? Are you saying more? they are also become virtual? <laughs> okay. All right. So I would like to firstly thank Ashwini Sharma, but for his fantastic. Labor, we would not have had such a wonderful session. He has been unwell, so yeah. he has come back. You know, in order to be with us, thanks, Satan Ashwin, thank and you. thank you, Subhu, for an amazing, fascinating session. And I really, really want to be back with all of you. Thanks a lot. And back. Thank you. I don't know.